It's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Hello, Dollar. This is Carter down at Tri-State Insurance. Yeah, I've heard of it. How are you, Bill? Fair. Listen, we have a vice president down here who has an idiot cousin selling insurance for us in New York City. Well, he's done it again. You call me for advice or sympathy? He just sold a $15,000 policy covering a pair of antique pistols for the trip from here to a buyer in Boston. Well, some of those old weapons are worth it. Well, these must be. That's why I want you to see that they get there. According to this Leonard Bonney, who brought the pistols this far from England, somebody tried twice to steal them. That we learned after he'd bought the policy. Will you take the job? Okay, Bill. And uh, when can I talk to this Bonney? He's at the doctor's, but he'll be back in my office in an hour. Doctor's? Yeah. The last time the thugs jumped him, they put a knife through his arm. <laughs> Edmund O'Brien in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office Tri-State Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention, William Carter. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during assignment on the Queen Anne pistol matter. Expense account item one, $1.75 cab fare from my apartment to your office, where I was introduced to Leonard Bonney, a tallish, badly proportioned man whose pasty complexion was just a shade darker than the sling that supported his left arm. Well, it's a pleasure, Mr. Dollar, a pleasure. Thanks. You, uh, you've had a pretty rough go of it. That's right. And it's the truth that I'm glad to see somebody else taking the responsibility. You, uh, might tell Mr. Dollar about these attacks on you. Oh, yeah, I'd be happy to, Mr. Carter. The first time was in Liverpool before I boarded ship to come across. They came out from between two buildings near the wharf. Three of them. They handed me a whack on the bean, and that's the truth. And before they could lay another hand on me, I raced off. Did you have the pistols with you? Oh, no. And I didn't have them in New York when another gang attacked me. They almost killed me with that knife. The pistols are here, Dollar. Would you like to see them? Yeah, I would. Here. Here, I'll uh, open the case. The box he opened was leather-bound and satin lined. Two pistols nestled in it. Graceful flintlocks with ten-inch forged barrels upon which were engraved a coronet and a name so faint that I couldn't make it out. They're from the 18th century. They're worth 10,000 pounds as a collector's item. Where do they go? Oh, to an antique gun shop at 272 Medford Street in Boston. The proprietor's name is Arthur Worthing. He's a British chap. He wears spectacles. You'll recognize him. Will you be coming with me? Me? (laughs) I don't think no. I've had enough. I'll stay here and wait word for Mr. Carter that the pistols have got their safe. Oh, no. I've had enough. The rest of the rundown was given to me before I left the office. Leonard Bonney had been hired as a messenger by the seller in London who had explained the value of the guns but had not mentioned any potential danger of attempted theft. With that information and the pistol case tucked into a corner of my luggage, I made arrangements to leave. Expense account item two, $9.75 airfare and incidental expenses between Hartford and Boston. The address on Medford Street that Bonnie had given to me was on the fringe of the retail district. There was a sign, and there were a few dusty weapons in the window. Good day, sir. Hello. Are you Arthur Worthing? Uh, yes, yes, I am. My name's Dollar. I've been hired by the tri uh-huh. uh-huh. uh, Mr. Bonnie telegraphed me to expect you. The package, sir. I see you have the package. <laughs> yeah, I have it. Uh, this is a day I have long anticipated, sir. There. Uh, Ah, there. Two masterpieces from the shop of James Freeman Norwich, circa 1705. Sir, are you a fancier of arms? Nothing antique. Oh, that's a pity, sir, a pity. Fascinating study. These pistols have quite a remarkable history. Fashioned during Queen Anne's reign and gave service during one of Europe's blackest eras. Yeah, they're pretty. But I like mine with less history and more shocking power. As might be supposed, sir, the English gunsmiths prospered during those stirring times, profiting by the constant demands for muskets and pistols to supply the good Queen's armies in Flanders. Ah, oh, is that right? Well, I have a paper for you to These sign. weapons, sir, rode through the campaigns at the belt of an officer raised near Norwich. 
And if the truth were known, sir, more than one murder has been committed not only by them, but because of them. Uh, tell me, sir, were you followed? Not that I know uh, if I could get your signature on this release, I... Oh, can... just a moment, young man. I, I believe that the assurance policy purchased by Mr. Bonney is in effect until the pistols rest in the possession of the purchaser. Is that not correct? You are not the buyer? <laughs> well, unfortunately, sir, a price of $20,000 is a great deal too dear for me. Well, who is it then and where? A Mr. and Mrs. Jack Rollins Bride. Bride. Okay. Address? Uh, yeah, yes, I'll jot it down for you. Just a moment. Uh, oh, eight Victoria Drive. Yeah, there you are. The large rest on the left flank as you approach it from the east. I think I can find it. Now that. give the pistols bride and tell them that either Mr. Bonney or myself will contact them at the earliest opportunity. All right, I'll get back to you by phone. <laughs> Afternoon, sir. I have a package to deliver to either Mr. or Mrs. Bride. Are they at home? Uh, yes, sir. I'll take it to them. Well, my instructions are to give it to them personally. Who is it, Dean? A gentleman with a parcel for you, madam. A parcel? My name is Dollar. Are you Mrs. Bride? Yes. Well, here are your pistols for Mr. Worthing. Well, come in. Mr. Worthing, I don't understand. Well, maybe your husband knows about it. Yes, perhaps that. Oh! Oh, no! Madam! What's the matter? <laughs> You can't. You can't. What's the matter, Mrs. Bride? Oh, oh heavens of terror. What's the trouble? Who is this man? What's he... Oh. Uh, uh, take Mrs. Bride to her room, dear. No, Jack. I want to know. What does it mean, Jack? What does it mean? Be quiet, Estelle. I'll take care of this. Uh, come along, Mrs. Bride. I'll help you to your room and get you a bromide. Now, what do you want? No, I don't want anything but your signature on this paper, acknowledging your receipt of the pistols described therein. You'll get no signature from me. Here, let me see that. Hey, watch it, will you? Leonard Bonney. He's here in America. That's what he said his name was. I brought the pistols from Hartford to a man named Arthur Worthing. He sent me to you. Who's Arthur Worthing? Well, I took it that you knew one another. He's a dealer in antique weapons. Yes. Of course. Get out of here. Take this fake form and take your pistols. Go back to your Mr. Worthing. Your bluff won't work. Now, listen, then. I don't believe that Bonnie is here. I don't think he's still alive. Now, get out of here! I didn't bother to argue with him because, as far as I could see then, he was either terrified, crazy, or both. With the pistols, I took the shortest route back to Arthur Worthing's gun shop on Medford Street. I should have saved myself the anger I'd built up to let go at Worthing. The place was not only locked, it was empty of antique weapons. And Arthur Worthing's sign had been replaced in the window by another which read, Office or Store for Rent, Inquire Number 13 Groves Building. I decided not to. Expense account item 3, 70 cents, day letter to Tri-State reporting my lack of progress. And expense account item 4, same as item 2, transportation back to Hartford. My phone was ringing when I unlocked the door of my apartment at 10 that night. Johnny Dollar. Bill Carter, Johnny. Did I interrupt something? Yeah, I just got in. Just came through the door. That's crazy business in Boston. What do you make of it? Well, the man called it blackmail, so I guess that's what it is. But what reason there was for using me, I don't get. Unless they figured Bride would get violent. I've been trying to reach that Bonnie. He left a phone number. Huh. What'd you get, the city pound? No, some woman with an accent so thick we can't understand each other. Oh, forget it. Bonnie just made it up. He was lying in his teeth about everything. Do you have the pistols? Yeah, but not for long. I'm bringing them down to your vault in the morning. Good. Stop by my office. Uh, aren't you curious about this thing? No, not even intrigued. I don't want any part of it. That was only half true. I didn't want any part of it, but I was intrigued. Later, after a shower and over a highball, I took the pistols out of their case and looked them over. Except for the possibility that they were the tools of blackmail, I could find nothing to make them worth $20,000. But under a strong light, I did make out the name engraved on the barrel that I hadn't been able to read before. 
was bride, as in Mr. and Mrs. Jack Rowland's bride. And the date behind it was 1704. I wondered what there was about something out of the 18th century that could send a 20th century woman into hysterics. The next day, I saw the pistols put under lock and key, started to work on another case, and try to forget the whole thing. But I was reminded of it again by the caller who was waiting for me in the corridor outside my apartment that night, the bride's butler. I hope you'll pardon my intrusion, sir. You must know why I've come. Well, I can guess. I shan't take up much of your time. But if I could just talk to you... All right, we'll go inside. Oh, thank you, sir. Sit down. Now, stand, sir. Could you possibly give me the pistols, Mr. Dollar? No. But why not, sir? Well, the main reason is I don't have them. Bride didn't seem to want them when I tried to give them to him. Oh, but he did, sir. He bought him putting his signature on the form which described them. It would have become an admission that he had received them. What's he afraid of? I couldn't say, sir. He told me that he wouldn't be able to answer for the consequences if I failed to bring them back. What does that mean? Mr. Bride is a very violent and sudden man. Look, I'm through with the case. I turned the guns back to the company that insured them, and he can get them by going down there and signing that release. I beg of you, sir, get them tomorrow morning and give them to me. I can't. Possibly because they aren't there. <laughs> it felt like a beastie. Then I got a look at the vial in his hand and the needle. His expressionless face watching me became diffused and was streaked with flashes of red. I tried to reach for the face, but it swirled away and out of sight. I took one stumbling step after it. That was the best I could do. We will return you to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. But first, we Americans have a valuable heritage a heritage of individual freedom that includes the freedom to worship as we wish at the church or synagogue of our own choice. By attending church regularly, we can gain the moral and spiritual strength to meet the many problems which confront us today. Help support your church and attend regularly with your family. Now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return you to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. You're in your flat. Oh, where... Where'd you come from? It's a good thing I came from somewhere. Mm. I've been playing touch and go with you since six o'clock. First you'd come two, and then you'd go again. Which time? What what time is it? Past nine. Yeah, you drink some of this. I uh, I looked for some tea, but I couldn't find any. I'm I'm not too handy at making coffee. Uh, Is that hot enough? Yeah, yeah. Oh, now, what happened to you? I don't know. Dope. He jabbed me in the arm. Who was he? Bride? Oh, come on, leave me alone, will you? Oh, no, you don't. Now, I've had enough of this. You stay awake. Come on, now. That treatment went on for another 45 minutes. That and the coffee. From the bed, I could see that my apartment had been torn to pieces. I was too sick to be angry about it. And when I could sit up and put my feet on the floor, I realized without surprise that Bonnie's arm was no longer in a sling. In fact, there was a Webley automatic in his hand. Oh, that. Well, the surgeon said I wouldn't need the sling anymore. Oh, you are a lying... Now, stand up now. Come on. Did he get those pistols? Oh. Right. Well, 
whoever it was tore up your flat looking for them. No, he didn't get them. And you aren't going to get them either. Oh, yeah, now. You've got a net on your shoulders. You use it. Where are they? You'll have to do more than wave that automatic around to get them. They're in a vault downtown. What do you want? A share for yourself? Look, it was your idea to insure those things. Bride wouldn't receive them, and the company wants to protect them until he does. You must have known that. Why did you insure them? Well, it was Worthing's plan. I told him it was too tricky. You're in a fine mess now. I've got to take you to him. Why? I can't do anything. Don't you ask so many questions. You just come along. He gun-muzzled me out of my apartment and into a car. If I'd been in better shape, I might have been able to break away from him. But with my system still full of dope, I didn't have either the will or the energy for a try. I only half remember the trip, but the end of it was a shabby hotel within earshot of the harbor in Boston. Bonnie, I've brought Mr. Dollar. Uh, capital, Bonnie, capital, come in. Hey, you're white as a ghost, Mr. Dollar. Are you ill? Yeah, and you don't help. They, uh, they put a needle into him trying to get the pistol. Oh, what a pity, what a pity. Sit down, sir, sit down, please, by all means. Uh, did they get him? Well, he says no, and if he's telling the truth, we're in a mess. In a mess, Bonnie? He says the pistols are locked up at the insurance company in Hartford. Well, now, is that the truth? I don't see why that should be hard to believe. Now, what do you say to that? I told you it wouldn't work. You and your complicated plans. Now we've lost the old thing. Nonsense, Bunny, nonsense. Why, actually, the pistols are of no consequence whatsoever. Well, they were important right enough in London when we first we talked about coming here with them. Of course they were, Bunny, but now they've served their purpose. The brides have seen them. You have spoken to them on the phone. It only remains for you to collect the money. The end of the past, Bunny. Well, I think we need them. Well, Mr. Dollar... It suddenly occurs to me that I have spilled the beans, as you yanked so quaintly put it. I've told you the truth. I don't want to know the truth. Why don't you keep quiet, Worthing? That's a good idea. Until I get out of here anyway. Bunny, stop him. Look, I have no place in this. Just leave me alone. Bunny, stop him. Or everything is lost. All right, me bucko. Come on back. Guy, get away from me. Come on. You don't feel so good. I hate to make you feel... Well... Yeah. That's right now. Back in the chair. What do you want? You want me to know what's going on? I do. Blackmail. Yes, of the grossest sort, sir. We shall be handsomely paid by the bribes to keep secret a two-year-old murder of which they are guilty. I don't care. Why don't you keep quiet, Worthing? Well, Mr. Dollar. If you expect me to be surprised, I'll have to disappoint you. What else could it be? But why were you stupid enough to think that he'd sign that release? Yes, I shall have to admit that my sights were too high. But a signed admission, <laughs> it was such a devilishly clever scheme, I was forced to have a try at it. And why keep me involved in it? Because you are a witness, so to speak. Now, be patient, sir. After being dragged into the lives of people I don't know and don't want to know, after being drugged and knocked around by your gunman? Enough of that. And now, Bunny, the hour to strike has come. I will meet the brides. Here. Here. Oh, by the way, let me have your Webley. Well, what about me? You, at the same time, will be at the bride residence waiting for them to return and make the initial payment of our $20,000. The contest is won, Bunny. Oh, I hope you're right, Worthing. It's been a long one. Yes, it has. A splendid quest. <laughs> Worthing concentrated on the Webley automatic while we waited, and I concentrated on my head. By the time the brides arrived an hour later, I was almost able to stand without staggering. Well, 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 well. Mr. and Mrs. Bright, late of Norwich. Our paths at last cross. Please come in, come in. I am Arthur Worthing. You don't know me, but I assure you that you will. Oh, you remember Mr. Dollar? Yes. We should hardly forget him. Yeah, you're not alone there. I'm afraid I have most distressing news for you, Mr. and Mrs. Bride. I shall be unable to make delivery since Mr. Dollar has gained possession of the pistols and steadfastly refuses to part with them. He is a veritable thorn in my side. Do you expect sympathy from us, Mr. Worthing? Well, indeed, I expect nothing of the sort. 
No more than your uncle, the Duke of Pembroke, would have expected from you had he known your true thoughts before you had him murdered. Are you lecturing, Worthing? You're planning to profit from the same death. Yes, quite a profitable death to everyone but the poor Duke. The estate fortune to the brides and to the others of us who nibble at the edges, a small share. Even you, Mr. Dollar, earned a penny or two. Cut this short, will you? It's a little too thick for me. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Bride, you both understand the terms that Leonard Barney and I have decided upon. We, in turn, agree to maintain complete silence in regard to your part in the murder of the Duke of Pembroke between 6 and 7 p.m., 8 October 1948, at which time, according to knowledge shared by us, a killer hired by yourselves did shoot said Duke to death. Well, how can we be sure if, as you tell us, Dollar refuses to give up the pistols? Mr. Dollar... Leave me out of this. Hmm. An unfortunate situation, but one of minor importance. The theft of the pistols has become, according to your plans, the generally accepted motive for the murder, in view of their extreme value, and since they did indeed disappear. But who... Who would correlate them to the true story? Oh, Jack, we could never be sure. Quiet as still. My word will be kept. But, Bonnie, I readily admit I do not know. The proof of your guilt lies with him, and he may decide that he needs more money one day. But the negotiation's at hand. The cost to you, $20,000. $5,000 to be paid tonight to Bonnie, who now awaits you at your residence. The rest within the next seven days. Oh, I didn't see how it's going to be possible. Oh, come now. Surely, rather than sacrifice the gracious life the Duke's fortune is affording you... I don't know. The time is so short. We'll manage it still. There must be a way. We have the 5,000. Bonnie will be waiting for you. Now Mr. Dollar has heard the story. What good is buying your silence? But first he knows, then someone else knows, and someone else... I... I can't... Still! In heaven's name, Bride, do you want the police to descend upon us? Then we all would be lost. All but Leonard Bonnie. I'm going to the police. I want them to know. Stop it, Estelle. Take her now and go meet Bonnie. Come along, Estelle. We'll go home. Convince her, Bride, that there is no reason to fear Dollar's knowledge. I have my own plans for him. Worthing's success made him careless. Calling his orders to the Bride, he was a quarter turn away from me. As soon as the door closed, I moved. As far as I was concerned, it was a toss-up between being a good citizen and phoning the police or using my head and leaving. I decided on a compromise, an anonymous report. I leaned over him to double-check his name and started through his pocket. His inside coat pocket gave me a week-old receipt for the weapons with which he dressed up his phony gun shop. His wallet held some money, but no identification. I patted his side coat pockets. They were cluttered with the usual men's debris and nothing else. But I patted the empty pockets again, and down at the bottom of the right one, I felt a thin, rectangular object. It was inside the coat lining. I got my fingers into the theme and ripped. The object was a card set into a plate of transparent plastic. It said, Arthur T. Worthing, Inspector, CID, Scotland Yard. Oh, the devil. Hey. Hey, Inspector Worthing. Uh, what? Uh, oh. I, I, I say that that, that that was rather... Here, here, try some of this. Thank you. <coughs> well, I, I must say that you're an extraordinary ally, Mr. Dollar. It would help, you know, if your allies knew they were allies instead of pigeons. Do you want to try and get up? Uh, not yet, I think. A vicious pummeling. <laughs> but more about that later. Suffice it to say that I've been posing as a blackmailer for so long that I scarcely know what I am myself. I couldn't shed my disguise in front of you until the final details were arranged. What is this approach of yours? Approach, sir. Oh, this crazy scheme. Here, come on. Take my hand. Oh, thank you. Not crazy, sir. Intricate, perhaps, but I did obtain a confession, didn't I? With you as a witness. During the investigation in England, no effort was enough to swerve the brides from their story of the murder. I had to turn criminal to meet them on a common level and gain the truth. And uh, did you have in mind stopping the brides before they commit another murder or after? Eh? That's an odd question, sir. Oh, no, not since this is making sense. Not since you baited bride with the idea that Bonnie was the only one that could prove them guilty of murder. Impeccable truth, Mr. Dollar, since it was Bonnie they hired to commit their crime. 
If the brides were apprehended at the scene immediately after they had murdered that miserable little cutthroat Leonard Bonnet, well, then, they'd be hard-pressed to find a valid reason for not confessing to the original murder of the Duke, would they not now? I think you soften the wife up to the point where she'd spill. Yes, by Jove, I believe you've hit the nail squarely on the head. We'll phone the police to go there. I think you hit the same nail on the head when you palled up with Bonnie and talked him into coming over here with blackmail in mind. Yes, yes, you're right. This has been a personal matter. The Duke of Pembroke was my friend. As I said, nothing could be done in England, so here I am. Unofficially, of course. I suggest now that I phone the police, don't you? Here, you are, driver. Keep it. Uh, thank you, sir. Good night, you. Good night, young man. Well, ah, no sign of the police, Stella. They'll arrive quietly. We'd better get up to the house. We dropped our cab a few yards down from the bride address. When we got there, we took the driveway. There was a light in a room I spotted the last time I was there. A library. We angled off toward it, but before we reached it, a look I tossed over my shoulder stopped me. Behind us in the street, I could see a swarm of uniformed figures slipping silently toward us. They were close, but not close enough. Now, come to it. Look, I'll give it up. I'll go back to England. You'll never be bothered by me. Help us. Take me in and cover the rear. All right, here, All right come on, you guys. Let's go this way. The inspector got what he wanted. The murder of the gunman, Bonnie, and the arrest of the brides. Justice is supposed to move in straight, formal lines. When that kind misfires, I guess it's cricket to go devious. He brought a victim as well as a motive clear across the Atlantic to set up the playoff scene. Expense account item five, same as number two, transportation back to Hartford. Item six, miscellaneous. You'll have to admit I deserve something for what I went through. $150. Expense account total, $365.35. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd with music by Wilbur Hatch. Edmund O'Brien can soon be seen in the Paramount Pictures production, Warpath. Featured in tonight's cast were Ben Wright, Bill Conrad, Dick Ryan, Jeanette Nolan... Dan O'Herlihy, and Tyler McVeigh. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bob Lamond inviting you to join us next week at this time when we will again bring you Edmund O'Brien as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Every Saturday night, Americans from coast to coast play Sing It Again. Do you? Well, if you don't, you don't know the fun and excitement you're missing. Not to mention radio's largest cash award if you can name the phantom voice. There's music on Sing It Again. Music with Alan Vale, Bob Howard, Judy Lynn, the Riddlers, Ray Block, and his orchestra. There are contestants from all over America, phoned by Dan Seymour. And there are prizes. Prizes galore, plus that special jackpot prize we mentioned earlier. So stay at home. Play at home on Saturday nights when over many of these same CBS stations, Dan Seymour says, it's Sing It Again. Stay tuned now for Von Monroe's Caravan, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. If you met a stranger on the street who offered to give you $4 for three, you'd be pretty skeptical. But when Uncle Sam makes the same offer, you can take him up on it and be sure you're getting a square deal. By investing your money in United States savings bonds, you'll get that extra dollar profit when the bonds mature. Buy your bonds through the payroll savings plan where you work or the bond-a-month plan where you bank. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.